just to see that chapel filled with, you know, what, 80 or so of these young men devoted to Christ and to the church and the Dominican order. I mean, it's just uplifting in a time when vocations are not flourishing in many parts of the church. So just to see that is amazing. The deeper issue is why the Dominican spirit now? And the answer is veritas in the Dominican motto, truth. I say to young Dominicans, this is your moment. This is your time. Uh, because more than ever, the culture needs precisely the preaching and teaching of the truth. I've known the Dominican Order since my time in the hometown where I grew up in West Springfield, Massachusetts. There's a monastery of cloistered Dominican nuns there. So I met them as their altar boy when I was 12 years old or so. And I was always drawn in. I noticed the Dominican difference, if you will, um, from that, that point. Because I saw the prayer life of the Order, as fervent as it is, and we here St. Dominic was always very fervent in prayer. And that was the beginning of his apostolate before he did anything else. He spoke to God. And he was also at the monastery of the Mother of God in West Springfield where he met the friars and was introduced through all the visiting friars who would come through to preach to the nuns about the active component of the Dominican life, preaching for the salvation of souls. And once again, I noticed uh, just a certain distinctiveness to the way that Dominicans preached. I remember very much feeling like in that preaching you encountered Christ, the way that friars wouldn't preach at the Mass. And um, so it was from both that encounter of the sacred liturgy and also from this very animated, sometimes conversational preaching about Christ, coming to know Christ and being his friend, uh, which really drew me to the order and taught me not only was St. Dominic a man of prayer who spoke to God, but then he was always willing and wanting to speak to others about God and, and really to communicate the joy of, of being God's friend. Lord our God, who in governing your people make use of the ministry of priests, grant a persevering obedience to your will to these deacons of your church, whom you graciously choose today for the office of the priesthood so that by their ministry and life, they may gain glory for you in Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. I met a Dominican two years before I entered. It was Father Ambrose Eckinger in the University of Delaware, and the experience was larger than life. He could preach, he could do all these languages, he could talk about music, but even more than all of that, I could tell he loved Jesus Christ. Uh, it wasn't just a person he talked about, it was a friend. Uh, and that spoke to me, well, I want to do that. Uh, I want to be a friend of Jesus Christ who can invite others into that friendship. What drew me to the Dominican order was this, the whole thing. The life of the preacher, the rosary, the devotion to Mary, the devotion to study, uh, and the life of the brothers, you know, and that it's not a solitary life, and that with all the joys and the trials of living with brothers. The priesthood was always on my radar screen as a, as a young boy going to Catholic school. When, when I really felt it was in Ireland, when I was preaching with this group, Net Ministries in Ireland, uh, at the end of our retreats for high school students, we would have confession available for them. And just available, it wasn't like forced. And seeing the before and after of these high school students going to confession, like I couldn't think of a better thing I can do with my life than to serve people, to bring the mercy of Jesus Christ. 
And so for me, the life of the preacher and the priest as confessor go hand in hand. That when you, when you preach, you get people thinking about Jesus Christ, you get them open to his mercy, open to his love. But with most things in life, it comes and it goes, especially for high school kids. Uh, they can sort of feel the zeal for a while, but it will probably fade for most of them. But for the forgiveness in the confessional is real and it's lasting, that those sins have been forgiven, those sins aren't coming back. Now they can go out and, you know, make new sins, sure, but uh, the mercy in the confessional goes hand in hand with, with the preaching of the truth, with the preaching of Jesus Christ. And that desire in my heart to preach Jesus Christ is seamless with that desire to offer his mercy generously to, to all his beloved. I am among you as the one who serves. It is you who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer a kingdom on you. Just as my Father has conferred one on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The Gospel of the Lord. I am an Australian. I was uh, born and raised uh, in Australia, and I lived there until the age of 27 when uh, I then uh, moved to England to do my graduate studies in economics uh, at Oxford. And after five years there, I then decided to enter into religious life first by working as a lay volunteer in the Philippines in a slum parish run by the Dominicans there. And after that year, I came to Cincinnati to enter into the novitiate for the province of St. Joseph, and then to Washington, where I studied philosophy and theology on my way to being ordained a priest two months ago. And here I am here at St. Louis Bertrand Church. Let those to be ordained priests come forward. Brother Antoninus Maria Sammy, Brother John Paul Kern, Brother Joseph Martin Hagen, Brother Norbert Kelleher, Brother John Mark Solitario, and Brother Paul Mary Clark. During college, there was a period where I had a spiritual awakening, and I realized that God did love me tremendously, and that this was actually the most important thing in my life. That relationship with God really changed the way that I viewed everything in life. And so I began to get more involved with the church, Really entering the Catholic Church was like opening a treasure chest in which um, there were some things that attracted me initially. So I would say especially a historic understanding that the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus Christ founded, and especially reading several of the early church fathers and seeing that indeed the apostolic way of life and you know really the fullness of what Christ gave the church, this is found in the Catholic Church. That brought me in, and especially the Eucharist that Jesus Christ is present in the unique way uh, in the Eucharist. This drew me in, but along the way, you know, I, once I got in, it was like opening a treasure chest and finding more and more riches. Um, so among these, again, is confession, that your sins are forgiven. To hear that concretely, this is a very powerful experience of God's mercy. Confession was sort of an unexpected one that I knew it would be necessary, but I didn't realize that that would be such an important part of encountering God's mercy. So that was part of my own experience of, of coming into the church, of finding these things. And then now as a priest, it's like, ooh, okay. Uh, now to be, as scripture says, a dispenser of the mysteries of God uh, and to be able to offer these things to other people is very beautiful. For some time since college, I really had a, a great zeal for sharing God with other people. And so that, that certainly drew me to the priesthood, understanding that the priest really connects people with God in many ways. Um, and that's closely intertwined with the order of preachers. So our charism of preaching for the salvation of souls, that was something that really drew me, especially when I heard about this Saint Dominic who especially in his famous conversation overnight with the innkeeper. So he's on the road, 
he meets an innkeeper who has a very muddled idea of God and is very confused and incorrect about some things about who God is. And St. Dominic is heartbroken that this guy doesn't know the love of God and the fullness of a relationship with him that he could have in the Catholic Church. So he stays up all night talking with this innkeeper to bring him back to the true faith so that he can have this relationship with God. And, and that really spoke to me as this was something that I found myself doing at various points, not so much with an innkeeper, but more with maybe like classmates or friends in college that occasionally would get those, those late night conversations about life a little bit and talking about what's most important and just, you know, desiring them to have that too. And I, you know, sort of encountered the story of St. Dominic that this was a man who had a similar zeal and he founded an order precisely for the salvation of souls, desiring to uh, bring everyone into union with God in this way. Uh, I just found that incredibly attractive. So I, I pursued entering the Dominican order and seven years later, here I am, uh, now an ordained priest. Brothers, you will be bridges that others might climb on you to God. You'll be priests so that your people might be sanctified. You'll be prophets that your people might hear the saving truth. You'll be kings that your people might walk the path of salvation. The very first priests were tempted, for want of a better term, by a type of clericalism. Then an argument broke out among them as to who should be regarded as the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are addressed as benefactors. But among you it shall not be so. Rather, let the greatest among you be as the youngest, and the leader as the servant. So brothers, love the people you serve. Sanctify them. Teach them. Shepherd them. Be a Jacob's ladder for them. I had a big conversion experience when I was 14 at summer camp because I realized that Jesus is real and that he's not just someone that other people talk about, but he really died for me. He lives now and loves me and wants to have a relationship with me. And so after that point, I really can see now that I was on the track to the priesthood because as I was then volunteering in this youth group and telling other people about Jesus, this desire to give myself to him grew and grew. And I started thinking about the priesthood because that seemed like the closest way of following Jesus. You know, here Jesus had given everything to me and I could give everything back to him by being a priest. And I had a special push in my vocational journey at the end of high school. Just after I graduated, I went to a vocation camp in Seattle and it was there that I decided I really wanted to be a priest and told the people there that this is where I thought God was calling me. And at that camp, I also dedicated myself to Mary for the first time. Marian devotion had not been part of my experience growing up Catholic, but when I gave myself to Mary with a rosary at the campfire, then I had the sense of her loving protection for me and her happiness that I was saying yes to her son. And that is another memory, like my initial conversion experience at summer camp that has always stayed with me and helped me when times have been difficult in formation. When I went to college, I was looking at a couple of different religious orders. I was especially interested in the Trappists because of the beauty of the monastic life, of the silence and contemplation they have. But I was also very involved in the campus ministry. I really was helping with retreats and Bible studies and wanted to bring in as many people to Christ as I could. And so it was kind of natural that when I met the Dominicans who have a preaching mission but also have these monastic observances and a contemplative life that I realized it was my vocation. There's only one Dominican in Boston. I was at Harvard for my undergrad and so I went over to see Father Romanus Cesario and he helped me to understand all the depth and beauty of the Dominican tradition, all the saints, St. Dominic and St. Thomas Aquinas, and the life of study and prayer, and the role of preaching, especially, was something that I hadn't appreciated much uh, 
that it is a special gift that God gives to allow the words of one man to move the heart of another to deeper faith or to conversion. And so I kind of went back and forth, even with the exposure to Dominicans, where I wanted to end up. And I spent a year after college teaching in New York. And then I went to Notre Dame for a year. But I kept coming back to the Dominicans and felt like I had to at least try out this vocation. And as soon as I entered, then I really had the conviction that this is where Jesus wanted me in this province to be his preacher, his priest. And I see how that was the fulfillment of the initial grace of conversion he gave me to not just call me to himself, but give me a conviction of his personal love. Because it's that love that motivates me to get up in the morning, to go to office, to prepare homilies. Uh, I just want to share that love with other people. Dear sons, before you enter the order of the priesthood, you must declare before the people your intention to undertake this office. Do you resolve, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to discharge without fail the office of the priesthood in the presbyteral rank, as worthy fellow workers with the order of bishops in caring for the Lord's flock? Do you promise respect and obedience to the diocesan bishop and to your legitimate superior? I do. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. Do you promise respect and obedience to the diocesan bishop and to your legitimate superior? I do. Do you promise respect and obedience to the diocesan bishop and to your legitimate superior? I do. Do you promise respect and obedience to the diocesan bishop and to your legitimate superior? I do. Do you promise respect and obedience to the diocesan bishop and to your legitimate superior? I do. Do you promise respect and obedience to the diocesan bishop and to your legitimate superior? I do. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. I entered the Order of Preachers in 2013 after working for a year after college, and it was a moment in the chapel of the university when I heard a homily on Romans 12 and that text speaks about offering your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And St. Paul also says, do not be conformed to this age but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And for me, as a graduate, having studied philosophy and Catholic studies and coming from a background of rich faith in my family, it was a real moment of just being overrun by grace and having the sense that this is what I'm made for, because it came sort of as the realization of several years of reflecting on and resisting vocation. Because when I was in high school, my two older sisters, one year apart from each other, both entered the Nashville Dominicans. And those two moments in 2005 and 2006 opened up to me a whole world where the renunciation of what seemed to be the greatest goods in life, your own freedom, your own chance for family and success in life, it opened up to me the possibility of a greater joy than I'd imagined. And so having known the Dominicans for, for so many years and having met the friars in Washington, D.C., it was something like a culmination of a lot of different graces that all kind of flooded together at one point in that chapel as I heard the priest preach on this text from St. Paul. And I realized that I was being called to really offer up the entirety of myself to abandon my own desires for, for freedom in light of a greater call and a greater freedom. And so those things converged for me into Dominican life and the priesthood in just sort of one fell swoop. There was never any wavering between the two. And it's kind of the genius, I think, of Dominican life. It's a life of preaching for the salvation of souls. And it's also this, this life of tremendous freedom. A freedom that perhaps our culture doesn't understand too well, but that just impacted me so deeply. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience today, uh, doing my first ordination of, of priests. A lot of thoughts were going through my mind and heart during the uh, uh, ceremony. One was my own link to the Dominicans. In many ways, a Dominican got me on the path toward priesthood, eventually toward being a bishop, and now in a way returning the favor, you know, ordaining 
Dominicans, but I also was thinking a lot about the apostolic quality of a bishop's uh, ministry. So you're a successor of the apostles, and that's in the elemental sense what it means, is this great chain that links us from today all the way back to Jesus and this little band around him. And then they imposed hands on others and passed on their authority and spiritual power. And that struck me a lot today that uh, I've been a bishop now for a little over three years, but doing in some ways the most characteristically Episcopal thing today to ordain a, a priest. Um, I, I found it extraordinarily powerful and this sense of being connected across time, you know, and all the great figures of the church all the way back to Christ himself. So it was extraordinarily powerful. Hear us, we beseech you, Lord our God, and pour out on these servants of yours the blessing of the Holy Spirit and the power of priestly grace that those whom in the sight of your mercy we offer to be consecrated may be surrounded by your rich and unfailing gifts through Christ our Lord. What the Dominicans bring is grace. And grace is not something we make, it's something that God gives. And to Dominic, Jesus Christ gave the grace to preach the truth of the gospel, to renew Christendom, to preach in a way that drew people back, preaching to their desires and preaching to the truth and engaging on their level. And that's the grace given to Dominic and to all of his sons and daughters. And so the confidence I have in the Dominican order is that the grace of Dominic is still running through the veins of Dominicans. It's a grace given to all the friars and nuns and sisters. It's a grace that corresponds to where we find ourselves as an American church, as the whole Catholic church. To evangelize is to share good news, that you won Gelion, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Now, making that claim is within much broader context of, of God's existence, of God's providence, of God's involvement with his people Israel, God's desire to save us from sin. So all these very objective claims are being made by an evangelist. And that runs up against the subjectivism and self-invention of, of the culture. What can Dominicans do? They speak the truth. And um, that's why, again, I'd say it's their moment. Because the culture, even though it, it plays this game of self-invention, and certainly young people know the rhetoric of it, for sure, I hear it all the time, but they don't believe it deep down. See, deep down, they're still hungry for the truth, and their wills are hungry for the good, and they know that a game of self-invention isn't going to satisfy anybody. And that's finally a wish-fulfilling fantasy. What they want is the truth. Dominicans, uh, both young and old, I think, are in the truth business. And, and the preaching business, uh, especially young people today, need preaching. They need the declaration of the truth, especially about God. And uh, I run across again every day, often behind a lot of bluster, but it's people who are starving and they're, and they're deeply sad because they're hungry for the truth, they're not finding it. That's what Dominicans, I think, can and should do today.